So today's lecture is presented by Associate Professor Rebecca Carey. And Rebecca last year was the winner of the Royal Society's MR Banks Medal. And this medal is intended to recognise outstanding mid-career researchers. And that achievement is, is just the most recent of Rebecca's achievements. She's got a very long list and I've shortened it. Um, Rebecca has been a, an Australian Research Council DECRA fellow, and that just probably sounds like mumbo jumbo, but believe me, these fellowships are incredibly difficult to get. There's probably only um, a handful offered nationwide every year. She was a Tas has been a Tasmanian Tall Poppy Scientist of the Year and winner of the Australian Academy of Science Dorothy Hill Medal. Rebecca's interested in volcanoes, pretty much all sorts of volcanoes, but especially submarine volcanoes, um, volcanic hazards, indigenous cultural narratives around volcanic events. And her research focuses <coughs> on understanding volcanic erup eruptions, especially explosive eruptions, and I'm sure she'll explain exactly what that means. And in fact, the title of the lecture gives you a bit of an idea. Um, Rebecca's lecture is Bang, Fizzle, Pop, Case Studies of the Interactions Between volca Volcanoes and Magma with the Ocean. So please join me in welcoming Rebecca. Okay, thank you very much, Jocelyn, for that introduction. And thank you to the Royal Society for the Maxwell Banks Award. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'll always accept an invitation to talk about volcanoes to the Royal Society. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge that some of the content that I'm presenting today is not my own work. It's the studies that have been conducted over the last few decades by many researchers and students into submarine volcanology. And some of that research is active today. So I'd like to acknowledge those researchers as well. And also all of the facilitators who enable ship-based research in the oceans. So let's start with a look at the ocean. This talks about the ocean and submarine eruption dynamics. So it's hard to imagine that 75% of Earth's volcanism happens on the seafloor. When we look at the oceans, we don't see that volcanism. The oceans hide both the submarine eruptions and the volcanoes that are responsible for those eruptions. In addition to hiding those eruption dynamics, the weight of the overlying water column of the ocean onto the volcanic edifices of the seafloor actually change or modulate some of the dynamics of explosive eruptions. And we'll talk about those today. So I'm one of the lucky few people who have been in a submarine down to the bottom of the ocean to look at what's down there. I'm not sure I would recommend that experience and I will not be doing it again. Um, but I thought, how about I take you all um, for a look at what's down there. So this is an autonomous robot called Sentry. It's autonomous. We program the mission of this robot on the boat and or the ship, I should say. And then we launch the sentry off the side of the ship and we release it. It goes away and does its eight to 12 hours of research. And then it comes back, we download the data, we process the data, and then we decide what to do next based on the data it's acquired. Now this robot sentry is very special. There's only one globally. And what Sentry does is it goes down to the seafloor and it maps the seafloor at high resolution. So equivalent to satellite mapping of topography on land, this is what Sentry does on the seafloor. 
So let's have a look at some of the outputs from sentry type vehicles. So what we're going to be looking at here is some seafloor topography. So this seafloor is uh, offshore eastern Tasmania in the Tasman Sea. And here these volcanic seamounts, which are the little green and yellow pimples that you'll see, are volcanic seamounts. And these seamounts are at ocean depths of between five and two kilometres. When you look, so this is sort of a fly through of that sea <coughs> topography offshore Eastern Australia. And when you look at this topography, you might think, oh, they're quite small volcanic edifices, but these volcanic edifices are huge. They've got 10 to 20 kilometer basal diameters uh, and heights of two to three kilometers. And, the, uh, and uh, they're, they're sitting in about two to three kilometers of water. So the ocean is hiding volcanic seamounts, even in our own neighbourhood. So when we look at a um, global map, we can see the land masses. And this map also is um, highlighting the seafloor, uh, sorry, the seafloor uh, topography. So in the last video I showed you, it was in this location here. There's a chain of seamounts that extend offshore Tasmania. And there are other seamount chains on the ocean floor. For example, the Hawaiian Emperor chain, the Cobb seamount chain, and other seamount chains. Another thing that's uh, recognisable in this seafloor bathymetry map are these kind of um, areas, jagged type areas that extend across multiple ocean basins. And these uh, areas are what we call mid-ocean ridges. So the earth is comprised of tectonic plates, the earth's crust, that move around on earth's surface. Now in places where the tectonic plates are pulling apart, we get magma upwelling and volcanoes along these, these mid-ocean ridges. Now, these ocean ridges look relatively benign and, 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 and not very obvious, but the mid-ocean ridge system is a continuous chain of volcanic mountains that extend up from abyssal seafloor depths up to about three and a half kilometres um, in height. And these are located in ocean depths between three and a half to five and a half kilometres. Mm -hmm. So these are actually chains of volcanoes and it's the mid-ocean ridge systems which are primarily responsible for most of the 75% of Earth's volcanism. Now sometimes volcanic seamounts can grow and become shallow and emergent, for example the Hawaiian Islands and I'm just going to take you to the Canary Islands to show you one of these emergent <coughs> volcanoes which is offshore Western Africa. So, so for some of you, you may remember this time last year, the 2021 eruption of La Palma in the Canary Islands. And these events are spectacular for scientists and the public alike. This eruption um, erupted magma of a very fluid type vis um, viscosity. It was a very fluid type magma. And when these magmas erupt on the Earth's surface, the eruption is spectacular. And what we typically see are lava flows, as well as um, these volcanic jets and eruption plumes. These types of eruptions happen globally. There's probably four or five of these a year. And we understand their dynamics really well because we've got modern instruments, both ground-based and satellite sensors, that help us to understand their dynamics. We can also send field geologists out to collect samples. So we understand their dynamics uh, very well because these are happening all the time. We create scientific hypotheses, new instruments, then these eruptions happen, we go there, we test our hypotheses. But in the submarine setting, these eruptions still occur, but we don't see them very often because of that water column and of the ocean. 
We just don't have the monitoring equipment in the ocean basins to tell us when these volcanoes are erupting. But there have been a few serendipitous discoveries of submarine eruptions since around 2004. And each one of those discoveries has really driven step changes in how we understand how magmas erupt on the seafloor. So there's been four observations of submarine eruptions, and I'll just show you the first, uh, the, the first one. And this is the POP case study. So um, this volcano is called West Marta volcano. It's situated near Samoa and Fiji. And this volcano is in about 1,200 metres of, of, of water. The ship and the robots that were on the ship were in this region at the time doing other science. And they detected this eruption and went there. And the ROV Jason, one of these robots, went there to observe this eruption. So this eruption also included that very fluid type uh, magma. So let's have a look at that. So my title was Bang Fizzle Pop. This is the pop case study. And here we can see the robot ROV Jason. Um, uh, capturing or observing these eruption dynamics. And there's a few things you can see in this video that, that are quite spectacular. The first is to the right hand side, we're getting lava erupted from a central vent edifice, and that lava is flowing down the flank of the volcano. The second thing is what you can see right now, and these are bubbles of volcanic gases with a film of this very fluid magma around them. So when magmas are at depth, they've got water and other gases dissolved in them. But as magmas rise and come up to the surface, that um, they depressurize and that gas has to be released. And in fluid magmas, these bubbles form and propagate through magma and arrive at the, um, on the sea floor. So here you can see some of the popping dynamics. And you can also see that when these um, bubbles are popping, they're ejecting fragments of the magma and those fragments are, fall, uh, are falling back close to the actual vent itself. So from this observation on the seafloor, we learned a lot about how submarine eruptions occur at significant depth, 1,200 metres below sea level. And just recently, there was a study conducted by a former PhD student uh, at um, Aaron Murch, who, who studied the time series of this bubble popping mechanism. And what he was able to identify with, these, um, with this time series is that the bubble arrives at the top of the magma column it's surrounded by a film of magma, but when that bubble gets to the surf, gets to the ocean, the magma cools very quickly, it quenches. And as it quenches, it forms cracks, and those cracks allow the volcanic gases in the bubble to condense. And so that bubble popping mechanism of bubble expansion and explosion actually isn't explosion at all. It's bubble implosion because the volcanic gases in those bubbles are condensing due to cold temperatures and high pressure. And so this is a really significant finding because in this paper, they speculate that for eruptions of this type of magma at depths greater than about 700 metres, we shouldn't expect explosions of bubbles. It's actually going to be bubble implosion. And if we think about that world map with all of those seamounts and all of that mid-ocean ridge system, that's at significantly greater depth. So this bubble implosion mechanism may actually be ubiquitous across all of our deep submarine systems. Okay, so we've looked now at the fluid magmas. Now I'm going to present a case study to do with sticky magmas. So magmas come in a range of different compositions and composition drives how fluid or sticky magmas are. With 
sticky magmas, the magma ascent processes from magma reservoirs at depth up to the surface are a little bit different. We still have magma in the crust that's being stored. The magma has dissolved volcanic gases in it, just like a Coke bottle has dissolved carbon dioxide in it. But as the magma starts to rise, the gas starts to dissolve. But the gas can't escape because the magma is so sticky. And so the gas bubbles and the magma are what we call coupled, and they rise together and depressurize in a magma conduit until it gets to the surface. Because the bubbles are buoyant and they're coupled to the magma, it leads to an acceleration of the sticky magma to the surface, which ultimately drives these very, very violent explosive eruptions because magma is rising at tens to hundreds of metres per second. So this is an eruption that um, these, st these style of very violent explosive eruptions, they happen perhaps once or twice every decade. Um, last, last decade, there were a few of these eruptions in Chile. And so if we assume that 75% of Earth's volcanism is happening on the sea floor, we should also be expecting uh, similar scales and frequency of eruptions of this sticky magma on the sea floor. But we just don't see those eruptions. We don't detect them because we don't have the sophisticated monitoring system on the seafloor that we do in the atmosphere, in satellite systems, ground based um, instruments. The last time, well, actually, the first time where we've got one of these violent eruptions of this sticky magma composition was in 1650, a volcano called Colombo in the Mediterranean. Now that eruption was very explosive because the, the volcano was only at, I think 250 meters uh, or so of water depth. And there are some historical records of those eruption dynamics and the associated tsunami that it formed. But only 10 years ago, I guess it's, yeah, I guess it's almost just past 10 years, there was another one of these events. And that occurred in the northern region of New Zealand in a place called the Kermadec Volcanic Arc, which extends from New Zealand up towards Tonga in this chain of submarine volcanoes. Now, it, this eruption occurred from uh, Havra volcano. And in 2002, Havra had been surveyed by a ship and a towed camera. So the New Zealand Geological Survey at the time, they knew a lot about Havre. Now the discovery of this eruption is quite unusual. So I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about it. Typically with eruptions, you detect them, discover them when you see the eruption products, which was, which was not the case in, in, for Havre. What happened was in mid August, 2012, a passenger on a commercial airliner was flying from Rarotonga to Auckland. And they looked out of their window and they saw what looked like an oil slick or a pumice raft. And so when that passenger got back to Auckland, they called Geological Nuclear Science New Zealand and said, look, I think I've seen an oil slick or, or something else in the Kermadec region. Can you tell me what it is? And the scientists had no idea what it is because it hadn't been detected. And so then they went through a series of satellite images of the Kermadec Arc area and found a snapshot of this pumice raft. Now she reported that mid August, this satellite image was collected July 18. That eruption had occurred three weeks before it was actually detected. And when we looked at the NASA satellite imagery, we got a time series of how that steam plume uh, was formed, as well as how that pumice raft, which you can see in grey in that satellite image, how that developed through time. So Martin Lutzler, a colleague of mine at University of Tasmania, looked through the stack of satellite images and determined that the pumice raft formed over about 21 hours. 
The area of the pumice raft was calculated and we estimated thickness and we came up with a volume of about 1 to 1.2 cubic kilometres of pumice. So that's equivalent to about 750 times the volume of the Melbourne cricket ground. And the eruption rates of pumice were about 1 million kilograms per second. So just based on those numbers, we knew that this was a very, a very um, significant high magnitude event, but it had a very benign surface manifestation to the point where we didn't even detect it at the time. Now, the pre-eruption seafloor topography was compared with the post-eruption seafloor um, topography. And what we could see is that there were differences. And those differences are highlighted in that map with the red and yellow areas. So just, just in here. So we knew there was a volume increase of volcanic products on the volcano, but we couldn't tell what those were. So a group of scientists from Australia, New Zealand, the US and Japan had some re uh, got some, re uh, some funding from national science agencies to take a ship down there with robots to discover actually what had happened. So we took the sentry, you've been introduced to the sentry on the bottom right previously. We also took this robot called the ROV Jason. ROV Jason is essentially our field geologist on, on the ocean floor. So it's tethered to the ship. It's got a fiber optic cable so that when it's driven around on the seafloor, um, by drivers who are in a container on the back of the boat. And we can see what the, what the robot can see on the seafloor. It's got these manipulator claws so that if scientists want to sample things, measure things, uh, then the, that robot does that for us. And it brings all of that material and those measurements back on board the ship where we look at those things. Okay, so in the next image, I'm going to be show, showing you the high resolution map of the top of Havara Volcano. So we're only seeing the very top of the edifice uh, and what that looked like. So this is a uh, quite an unprecedented view of a submarine volcano in a thousand metres of water depth. The scale of this bathymetry or topography is one metre. So anything that's greater than one metre on this volcano at more than a kilometre depth, we can see it. And I've put a couple of Nemo's in the image so that uh, to get you to remember that this is a volcano that's at the bottom of the ocean. It doesn't look like it from this map. Okay, so one of the, after we'd done that ex, um, expedition three years after the eruption, one of the really striking conclusions was that at the surface, all we saw was this pumice raft, but our exploration of the edifice itself and five PhD studies later, we were actually able to demonstrate that this was a very complex event. What we didn't see at the surface was intracaldera silicic lavas. So these are uh, silicic lavas that were produced during the eruption that had no surface manifestation on the sea surface. We saw caldera rim lavas. So that's, that's these ones over here and this big red one over there. For scale, this red one over here, this lava is a lava dome. It's about a kilometre basal diameter and it's as high as four rest point casinos on top of each other. So although it looks quite small, it's quite, quite a huge volcanic product from this event, but again, no surface manifestation on the ocean surface. We found caldera wall collapse deposits, mass wasting deposits everywhere, and fragmental seafloor deposits. So what's really striking is that had the pumice raft not been produced, we wouldn't have discovered the eruption. And this eruption was really complex and that complexity had no surface manifestation on, this, on the ocean. Okay, so I wanted to show you one really exciting thing about this um, eruption and the eruption products. And so in this next view, we're going to, it's, it's going to be as if we're standing in this crater, in this caldera, and we're going to be looking back 
towards the wall that are looking at these very high caldera walls. So here we are, as if we were standing on the bottom of the caldera on the top of this massive volcano. The caldera walls are about 600 metres in height. And the AUV century bathymetry, the topography of the caldera floor, showed this bumpy terrain. And the bumpy terrain wasn't there before and we didn't know what it was. But the, so we sent the ROV Jason down to have a look and we looked at what this bumpy terrain was. Now, each one of these bumps is a big slab of pumice. And how big? About SUV size. The largest one we saw was about nine metres in length. So these things were absolutely huge. And there's not really any equivalence that we see on land of this type of pumice, of that size. So a, PH, a few PhD students have worked on the, um, the rocks and the, the measurements that we took on this uh, volcano. And one student in particular from the University of Hawaii, as well as some researchers from University of California at Berkeley, came up with a model for how mag uh, high discharge rates of this sticky magma um, erupt under very high pressure conditions, one kilometre of um, pressure associated with that overlying column of water. Now, this model was derived from measurements of those pumice, giant pumice clasts, as well as some numerical modelling, which incorporates all of the characteristics of the magma together with uh, the pressure at which it was erupted as, yeah, principally those two things. And they came up with a model, the numerical modelling demonstrated that that magma doesn't fragment at depth. It doesn't turn from a liquid magma to a gas and pyroclast mixture at depth. The magma essentially gets to the vent as a, as a liquid, and then it interacts with the sea, with, with the ocean. Now, when hot magma at 800 degrees Celsius interacts with the cold ocean, it turns from a liquid to a solid, it goes through this process that we call quenching. And in that quenching process, it, it propagates cracks through the rock. And during the cracking process, seawater can access those cracks, leading to vaporization and fizzling of the water. And essentially the propagation of cracks is driving the size of those giant pumice clasts. Some of those giant pumice clasts fizzle and have enough buoyancy to get up to the ocean surface to produce that pumice raft. But some of those fizzling dynamics mean that the pumice rafts saturate really quickly and fall to the south sea floor. So that was one really important outcome of, of our voyage was that the pressure at a kilometre depth is so significant that we don't expect explosive disruption even at high mass charge, discharge rate of this type of magma. The pressure is so great that the magma just gets to the surface and, and, and fractures. Now that voyage included a lot of researchers and a lot of PhD students. And over the at last, I guess, seven or eight years, we've done a lot of research and we've made some really important contributions to understanding how submarine dynamics work for these sticky silicic magmas. So I'd just like to acknowledge that team. All right. So what have we talked about so far? We've talked about popping dynamics of fluid type magmas at pretty extreme pressures. We've talked about fizzling dynamics of sticky magmas at intermediate depths. And now for this last case study, I want to take you to shallow submarine emergent volcanoes. Now, these volcanoes are quite common. For example, um, White Island, Fakari, New Zealand, as well as Hanga, Tonga, Hanga, Hapa'ai here. And when we look at these volcanoes with satellites from a plane, we see these types of edifices. And you, you, could, you could be convinced that, you know, that this is a very small volcano. But what we do know is that these volcanoes are coming from the deep seafloor. They're cone-shaped volcanoes. And what we're seeing at the surface 
is really only a peak of the actual total volcano volume. Now, Hanga Tonga Hanga Hapai is actually a very large volcano, equivalent to Mount St. Helens, Ruapehu. It's got a diameter of about five to six kilometres at the top, even deeper, basal, sorry, even wider basal diameter. Uh, and it also, it also has this caldera or crater at the top. So let's go to the Bang case study. If you were in Alaska, New Zealand, Fiji, Tonga, you would have actually heard the, bomb, the bang. This eruption was so loud that you could hear it from up to 10,000 kilometres away. This is a series, a time series of images from satellites which show the injection of volcanic gases, volcanic ash, as well as water into Earth's atmosphere. Another thing you can see in this series of images is the shock wave or the sonic boom, if you like, the air pressure wave that's also being triggered by this eruption. And I'll just point that out for you here. So this is the plume, that's the shock wave migrating off. Okay. Shock you again. Shock wave. Okay. Now that shock wave, it made its way to, the, to its antipode about 12 hours later. It was traveling about 300 meters per second. So this Eruption was one of the most explosive events of the last century. It had an energy equivalent to 100,000 Hiroshima bombs, according to some of the science reports I've read. And that sonic boom was heard up to 10,000 kilometres away. So this eruption is really um, uh, quite novel and exciting from a scientific perspective, but it's also important to recognise that this eruption triggered a tsunami that, um, that caused three fatalities devastated the Kingdom of Tonga and also led to a delayed um, response of help into Tonga. So let's talk about some of the dynamics of this eruption. First of all, there are, there are lots of unprecedented components of the science of this eruption. The first is that the eruption plume is the highest recorded in modern instrumented time. It reached 57 kilometres, which is at the troposphere stratosphere, it's the mesosphere. And it got there in 40 minutes. So it had an injection speed of about 60 metres per second, which is the fastest injection speed ever recorded. Now the eruption occurred in shallow seawater and scientists have reported that this eruption injected millions of tonnes of ocean water into the stratosphere. So I'm not an atmospheric scientist, but an increase of about 10% of water vapour into our atmosphere does sound like quite a lot. Now, typically with these very violent explosive eruptions, we see an atmospheric cooling effect for some short period of time afterwards. So for example, the Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines in 1991, it led to a global well, not a global cooling, it led to a cooling of about 0.5 degrees Celsius for one to two years after the eruption, mostly in the equatorial region. Now that happens for a few reasons, but two important reasons is that volcanic ash in the atmosphere, atmosphere it reflects solar radiation. So the heat that's coming in from the sun gets reflected back out of our atmosphere. The second thing is that eruption magmas contain lots of uh, sulfur dioxide. When that's pumped into the atmosphere, it reacts with the water vapour in the atmosphere and forms these tiny droplets of sulfuric acid. These tiny droplets are also reflective of solar radiation. So those two parameters are driving atmospheric cooling on very short timescales. Now, this event is different. Scientists are predicting this is actually going to be a warming event for a few reasons. Firstly, that there's a lot of water in the atmosphere and water traps heat. Secondly, the satellites didn't detect very much sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. So the hypothesis at, hypothesis at the moment is that that sulfur gas was reacting very early with water in the eruption plume and, and that those tiny sulfuric droplets, acid droplets, didn't actually make it to the, the stratosphere. So scientists are predicting a slight warming, but on very short timescales. 
What is absolutely fascinating is this atmospheric wave that propagated out from the eruption site. So the eruption began and a few minutes to tens of minutes later, this air pressure wave um, was triggered and travelled at through about 320 metres per second around the Earth. In 72 hours, it had travelled three times around the whole planet. Now, our atmosphere is a uh, fluid. The ocean is also a fluid. Now, the ocean is not moving at 320 metres per second, but the atmosphere around this pressure wave is. So when you get that velocity gradient between the ocean and the atmosphere, it triggers waves at that boundary. And waves at that boundary for this event triggered what's called a meteor tsunami. Now, before this event, never heard of a meteor tsunami. And the idea of a pressure wave triggering a tsunami wave was a bit mind boggling. But the way it works is it's just that velocity gradient that triggers a wave at the boundary. And the, this wave, so there have been meteor tsunamis um, recorded previously, but not ever for a volcanic event. So this was the first ever meteor tsunami recorded for a volcanic event. Okay. And these tsunamis not just propagate in the ocean basin where the eruption occurs, but it also propagated in ocean basins that weren't connected. So for example, in the Caribbean, they recorded a tsunami wave related to this <coughs> pressure wave. So this um, is really kind of an, an opening of new active research, understanding how these um, pressure waves can be integrated into tsunami models to help people prepare for these tsunamis. We can't actually forget about the tsunami itself. So tsunamis typically form when there's vertical displacement of uh, the ocean, and there was a vertical displacement associated with this eruption, and that triggered that tsunami. Tsunami was only up to about 1.7 metres in height, but again, those islands of the Kingdom of Tonga are very flat and a very low elevation. So what we've seen, uh, what we could visualise are things to do with the ocean and the atmosphere. We've got a whole bunch of satellites out there, ground-based sensors that were recording air pressure waves and plumes and things. But the drivers of this eruption are actually present underwater. So what happened underwater? Well, the answer is we don't really know. The eruption was surveyed in 2016 by the RV Falcor. It was just recently surveyed by the Korea Polar Research Institute, who have kindly given me this graphic. And you can see that there's a giant hole. So let's play that video again. Here we have the 2016 survey, where you can see the caldera in the background, very shallow edifice, and 2022 survey, big giant hole. So that hole is actually an 850 metre deep caldera. The pl atmospheric plume models suggest that a cubic kilometre of rock went into the atmosphere and was dispersed. But this, there's about five cubic kilometres of the volcano missing. And where is it? The answer is we don't know. But presumably it's somewhere on the seafloor. How it got there, we don't know. After this eruption three months later, I had a, I had a geologist who was on a, on a ship in the Lao Basin adjacent to Hunga Tonga email me um, to say that they had discovered metre thick ash deposits 88 kilometres away from the Hunga Tonga site. He's kindly shared this map with me. Now, these sites in green, red and blue were their survey sites. For 20 or so years, ships have gone there with robotic vehicles to see how hydrothermal, hydrothermal vents evolve, as well as how they support the biological ecosystem. So they went back there to, to essentially get another data point to see how the hydrothermal system had developed and also to survey what well, the biological communities were there. But when they got there, everything was covered with volcanic ash, up to 1.5 metres of this volcanic ash. And so the initial question was, well, is this Hungatonga ash at 88 kilometres, a metre and a half thickness? It's hard to imagine that getting 88 kilometres 
88 kilometres that far from vent. <coughs> but from what Marcus has said so far, it does look like it's Hungatonga ash. So there's some sort of transport mechanism on the ocean floor that distributed that five cubic kilometres of missing volume out to, to more than 100 kilometres from source. And that's really mind boggling. I don't think um, many volcanologists had considered that that was actually possible. So when we look at the seafloor itself, so on the right hand side is a seafloor topography map. Red equals shallow edifices, green equals deeper edifices. You can see that there are these really interesting kind of wavy textured seafloor terrains. This is the most obvious one, but if you look at higher resolution, you can also see this wavy terrain here. Now these wavy terrains are actually very common around submarine volcanoes. Most of the time they're related to underwater landslides. And this is an area of research that, that Marcus is currently following up to understand whether this wavy seafloor texture is related to these dense currents of volcanic ash that are flowing on the seafloor. This is actually a research question that we've been interested in for a few years. So Martin Yutzler from University of Tasmania and myself have been interested in how, in what these sediment waves are. Are they always related to landslides or are they related to dense flows of volcanic ejecta? And Martin led a voyage in April 2022 to a volcano in the Kermadec Arc, close to Havre, which is called Macaulay. So Macaulay is a much bigger volcano. It has a diameter of 10 kilometres rather than five kilometres. And you can see beautiful examples of these sediment waves. Now, the eruption was um, about 5,700 years ago that formed these sediment waves, and this is a much larger scale event. But still, the research stemming from this voyage will provide us some um, science to do with how these sediment waves form and how calderas collapse to drive those sediment waves. So this is an active area of research for a couple of PhD students in our group, and we're trying to entice Marcus to um, come south and work on this problem with us as well. Alrighty, so this is the Bang case study. What did the scientific community learn? We've learned lots already with pretty minimal observations, and there's still a lot more to do. The exciting thing about this eruption is not only are we learning about solid earth processes, but the atmospheric scientists are also learning about how volcanoes influence processes going on in the atmosphere and also in the oceans. So these dot points are all areas of active uh, research. But one of the most exciting things I find about this, this Tonga event is just how these different disciplines will need to work together and communicate to answer some of these questions. The, the atmospheric scientists will need to talk to geologists to understand the rates at which that material is injected into the atmosphere. The physical oceanographers will need to know about mass discharge into the ocean to understand how those tsunami waves were propagating. And that's, these events are relatively rare getting the degree of multidisciplinary interaction needed and when this happens in the next decade or two decades, it's going to really lead to some fundamental step changes in earth, atmosphere, hydrosphere dynamics. And I think that's one of the really great things about this event that's going to unfold. Okay, so um, I'd like to again acknowledge the, the researchers, the ship-based voyage crews who have really facilitated all of this science. And I hope you've enjoyed the case studies of Pop, Fizzle and Bang. So we have time for questions, if anybody has one. I have one. <laughs> um, I would like to know about those volcanoes that you showed to the east of Tasmania. Are any of those active? Do any of those fall into these categories? <coughs> we, we went on a 
voyage with our own research ship, uh, the investigator, in 2018 to uh, survey those. So we've had four years of, of study on those. Uh, so they are um, a series of age progressive volcanoes, similar to the Hawaiian Islands where you have the chain of volcanoes that um, have different ages. This is a seamount chain derived from a magma plume that was erupting, magma getting to the surface, and those volcanoes are forming. Uh, and we've got our um, age dates back for the, those seamounts, and they're between 68 and 35 million years. Right. So <laughs> nothing active, right. unfortunately. Right. Excellent. Thanks, Rebecca. John. Rebecca, you said that Harbour wasn't detected until 2017. Did you show up on the seismic equipment? Yeah, really good question. There are a few uh, islands around Havara. Uh, that do have uh, seismic stations on them to help with earthquake prediction and triangulation of epicentres and depths of earthquakes. Um, and so when we found, when we discovered this eruption, uh, some scientists went back to that earthquake record to see if, if, if it was obvious and it was just missed. And there was nothing, there were some high magnitude earthquakes at the time, but nothing that was kind of a eureka type, this is a, these earthquakes are related to a, a new eruption. Yeah, so we, we just need a higher density of, of arrays really to detect eruptions in the ocean basins. Yes? Rebecca, um, with these underwater eruptions, the sulphur dioxide that's erupted, does that react with the seawater to increase the acidity of the, uh, the seawater around those eruptions? Has there been any studies of that? Because I imagine you were talking about the SA2 combining with atmospheric water to produce sulphuric acid. I imagine a lot of it would be lost in the, in the ocean too. Mm. Yes, so I don't really know much about the sulphur story in the ocean, but I'd expect that signature to be um, diffused relatively quickly in the ocean. But what I do know is that the uh, ha having that injection of volcanic products in the ocean, and those volcanic products are iron rich, led to phytoplankton high productivity for the weeks following the eruption. And so iron is a nutrient in the ocean and those phytoplankton were gobbling it all up as quickly as they could. But I don't really know much about the sulphur story. Sorry, Ross. Yeah. Presumably the volume of sulphur, though, compared with the infinite <coughs> amount of water available would lead to dilution very quickly, I would have thought. Yes, I, that's, that's probably right. I mean, I, I studied the... Um, effect of sulphur isotopes on pyrite um, that may relate to certain volcanic events um, with large igneous province events. And yep. um, we published a paper on this several years ago and you can see a correlation in sulphur isotopes, a change in the mm -hmm. sulphur isotope composition of the ocean that related to large igneous province events. Um, yeah. So I suspect that when you've got continuous volcanic eruptions, it could, have, could affect the ocean chemistry. That was our conclusion. Mm. Yeah, this event would be three, four orders of magnitude less volume. So probably not enough to drive an ocean signal, I'd expect. Uh, yes? Can you go back to just the map before What's the temporal and geographic association between earthquakes and the volcanoes? Yeah, yeah, it's essentially mostly one-on-one, -on -one, is that uh, where you have plates moving apart or plates coming together, that triggers stresses in the earth, which then trigger earthquakes. Uh, and so uh, we see that a lot of the, vulcan the volcanoes are uh, along these um, convergent or divergent plate boundaries where plates are coming together or pulling apart. Uh, but there are also uh, volcano, uh, sorry, there are also earthquakes 
associated with magma moving through Earth's crust at these what we call hot spots. So this is where we have plumes of magma coming from the deep earth to the shallow earth. And as the magma is intruding the crust, it creates earthquakes which are detectable. In Indonesia, um, they have quite a lot of earthquakes, but it doesn't seem to be on the volcanic nasty uh, rock. Yeah, so Indonesia is part of the Pacific Rim of Fire. Yeah. So it comes up north of New Zealand, across Fiji, Samoa, Lao Basin, up into Indonesia and around. <coughs> yeah, so Indonesia probably is the country that has the most volcanoes globally, actually. Okay. Yeah. Yes? When you were talking about the silicic uh, eruptions, uh, you made an estimate based on <laughs> the fact that three quarters of the surface is covered in ocean. Uh, the court of common member, but I would have thought that the silicic magnets are much more associated with fundamental crust or with the uh, convergent boundaries where continental crust is being generated. And so you would probably have a much lower um, proportion of, of silicic volcanic eruptions and you would be more naked, naked, naked. Yeah, yep, so that's it. Right yeah, that's right. No, you're absolutely right in that most of Earth's submarine volcanism is mafic at the mid-ocean ridges, but where uh, we've got volcanic arcs, they can both be have subaerial expressions like in Japan or submarine expressions like in the Marianas or the Kermadec arc. So it would be a really um, interesting calculation to do to work out what area or volume of arc you have, uh, how much of that is subaerial versus submarine, and to think about what sort of frequency and volume of submarine solicit events we would expect. Yeah. Yes? Um, what's the connection between, say, that latest case study in Tonga, uh, the bank, and weather patterns, you said so much water went up into the atmosphere. Would that like, mm. increase rainfall around the world? Or? Yeah, from what I've read, there's been relatively few papers published because it's only been 10 months since that eruption. And I've not, there's only one paper so far that talks about the injection of the material into the mesosphere and those effects. And from what I've what if that paper was really focused, uh, well, I paid, actually, I won't say that, I paid the most attention, the shiny things, to how much water got into the stratosphere and the mesosphere. I didn't act, and how that affected short-term climate. I didn't actually probe further to look at how that may affect rainfall. But my, hmm, yeah, and I, I don't know the answer either. Thanks for the question. <laughs> yeah. Can I guess go back because I'm a very slow thinker? <laughs> Is, does that presage a volcano as, uh, which is likely in the near future or is it the other way around? Or uh, do they tend to be twins? In other words, if so, in what order? I think that's one of the really outstanding questions in science is that do tectonic earthquakes trigger any type of movements of magma in the crust, which then would trigger a volcanic eruption? And there are papers time to time that use different numerical approaches to say, yes, it's a, tr yes, it's a trigger in certain circumstances, or no, there's no relationship of an earthquake with a an eruption that, that fo follows shortly thereafter. And so I think that's, it's probably very, very location specific, but it's also a very contentious question that's not well understood. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for a very interesting lecture. Um, being a geomorphologist, I want to start in terms of um, subaerial processes operating in landscape that comes above sea level. Mm -hmm. uh, when your volcanoes and the detritus of it comes above sea level in these areas of Japan, 
it can become relatively quickly eroded in the long term geological time. When you go below sea level to the depths that you're treating, uh, presumably the alteration of the form of the volcanoes takes place partly by uh, tectonic effects of collapse of the volcano, and you did show uh, drifting of the uh, ash and also the equivalent of uh, submarine collapses on the edge of the shelf. But are the, the real question is, are the uh, volcanoes much more durable after they've happened in the submarine environment, or are there specific deep currents and processes mm -hmm. that are sufficiently known to say how those volcanoes are eroded and reduced apart from the tectonic movements and plates? Hmm. Perhaps a big question, but I don't know. Yeah, so I guess you can answer that question on a range of scales. So, for example, at Havre, we've got a PhD student, Shannon, who has looked at 240 hours of video footage from within the caldera of Havre and looked at how the ash is being remobilised after just three years. So there she can look at bed forms to get current directions to see how, how ash is being mobilised. So on a very local scale, that remobilisation happens from day dot. On a larger scale, I guess it sort of depends a little bit on how unconsolidated the volcano is and how unconsolidated those products are. And absolutely, earthquakes and things are going to remobilise those submarine deposits over time uh, to drive things like landslides. And I'm trying to think if there's a modern example of that. Just can you think of a modern example of an earthquake remobilising submarine or mobilising submarine mass wasting? Well, it probably happens, but whether we've got a record of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the big question. Hmm. What, what we think is that once you get below wave base, below that depth of water that is um, active in moving sediment and rock on the seafloor, once you're deeper than that, that it's really only mass wasting events and earthquakes that do major damage to volcanoes. So you're right, they are more durable long term in deep water. That's the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> we probably should give Rebecca a break and this is one of the online questions. Are there any online? No. Okay. Well, can you, is, it, is it quick? <laughs> well, I have a quick one. But, um, I've read of a, a mega eruption in Indonesia about 50,000 years ago. Do you know much about that? Eruption that people um, have estimated that it changed the climate of the Earth. Oh, uh, right. Years. Yeah, so right. that's um, yeah. the Tambora eruption. Oh, sorry, Toba. Did you say 50,000? Toba. There's up to 74,000. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, Toba, 74,000 right. years ago. And that was also a very large caldera forming event. Uh, it's also a volcanic island. And there are really substantial thick volcanic sediments around the <coughs> island. And I forget its actual volume, but it is thought to have significantly changed climate to the point where it affected mankind. Don't know many details about it. Yes, I was reading yeah. recently how it may have affected the movement of um, homo sapiens yeah. coming yeah. across in and down yeah. in yeah. Australia that it might have actually prevented that that movement happening mm -hmm. at that time. Right. Yeah. Thank you on behalf of everybody present for an absolutely fabulous yeah.